Thank you for listening to this podcast from the chapel. stupid football game we're not playing in. We lift our hands at a concert for somebody that just got 65 of our dollars. We lift our hands when we win. We lift our hands when we're frustrated. God just wants some people who say, listen, God, this is no joke for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you. I didn't think I was going to, but I think I'm going to go into this. Go ahead and sit down. Nathan, can a couple of you guys either put that down or grab a little my, a little music stand or something? Vern, you can probably handle that by yourself. Do you know there's a place you can go in God where you won't need to be encouraged all the time? Let me say this to you. I think that we've built a culture in the church that entitles people to come hear what they want to hear and keeps people from hearing what they need to hear. Most of what you need to hear is not what you want to hear, and most of what you want to hear is not what you need to hear. And you have to get into a place where you're hungry enough to come into the next dimension that you don't mind somebody messing with what's going on in the dimension you're in. If you get frustrated enough with this realm, then you'll let God disrupt this realm in order to give you access to the realm or the dimension you were really designed for. You really weren't designed to live here. You really don't fit here. You're really not from here, and you're not spending very much time here, and you certainly won't have any association with here in eternity. So there's something alien about you. When Paul tells Timothy to be courageous, the word parkalilion is where we get the word alien, parakalion. And so there's an alien nature about you, and out of that alien nature, there's something that is crying for the dimension you came from and the dimension you will finish in. And you're really in a transient realm, and God never intended for you to get very wrapped up in life here. God intended for you to taste something out of another world and then for you to become the conduit or the heaven and earth connection or, as we use in prophetic terminology, the portal that brings things from God's dimension into our dimension. And what happens is we try to figure out how to taste something from one realm and then settle right back into the normal rhythms of life as usual. And there's something about normal that won't work on you. There's something about a commitment to the things of this world that will always keep you on a roller coaster ride of inconsistency. And what God's trying to do is God's trying to draw you to a depth of understanding, to a depth of revelation, and ultimately to a depth of relationship that re-identifies your association with things of this world. And all of a sudden you start understanding that God did not put me here so the things of this world could determine the rhythm of my life. But God put me here so that the rhythm of his kingdom would be heard in and throughout a culture that's desperate to touch something that's not fading away. I know that's a little heavier than maybe what you came for this morning. But I want you to understand why you don't fit. And I want you to understand why normal Christianity doesn't work for you. I want you to really understand why you're weird. Or as the Bible puts it, if you're more comfortable with the terminology, peculiar. The Bible called you peculiar. If you're not peculiar, you're not living a life that is in rhythm with the Word of God. If you fit in, if you're easily able to morph into chameleon mode, something about you has to stand out. There's got to be something about you that is distinct. 
There's got to be something about you. It's where we get the whole concept of sanctification or set-apartness. There's got to be something about you that says, I have tasted something in God that has made me appreciate his nature to the point that I'm letting his nature change mine. And I'm going to show you some things. Can I have a little bit more volume up here? I don't know what y'all are doing back there. Y'all don't know what you're doing, apparently. A bunch of preachers and singers. You get a bunch of preachers and singers in the sound booth, it's just horrible. To get me some in-ear monitors, I guess, if I'd be like Matt and get my in-ear monitors up here. <laughs> Go with me over to Mark chapter 8. That's not any better at all. Mark chapter 8. Where? Where? <laughs> There, that's better. As Lyndon said, I'm not touching it. I'm back here. It's all Matt. That's good. Y'all got a perfectly intelligent young man sitting over there in the corner that probably know how to fix it if y'all move out of his way. <laughs> Mark chapter 8. The reason I have to have the, have the volume so loud is not because I like to hear myself. It's because I do this way too often. And so uh, I leave Tuesday. We kick off the school year at Christ for the Nations. Uh, Institute, and I'll be doing the Tuesday night first service, and then we shut all the theology classes and all of the eschatology, we shut all that down for the first two days of school, and we just have revival. And uh, Dutch Sheets, who will be here uh, in a couple of weeks in the services here, is the overseer of that institute, and his theory is if I can get these kids saved on the first week of school, my life's going to be a lot easier for the rest of the year. So, <laughs> so I'm the come get them saved person, I guess. They definitely don't want me teaching them systematic theology. I'll, they'll, it'll be bad. Mark chapter 8. I'm going to begin reading here in verse 22. Mark 8, 22. It's a very simple little teaching, and I don't want to keep you here long because my wife has the children today, and that always happens to her on the day I preach, and I go way longer than Johnson does. So she wants to make sure next time it's scheduled where she gets to work the children on a Johnson day, not a Damon day. She says it's because she wants to hear me preach, but I know better. Mark chapter 8, verse 22 says, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. They brought a, brought a blind man to him, him being Jesus, capital H there, and begged him, capital H, him being Jesus, to touch him, lowercase h, the blind man. Verse 23, so he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands, him being Jesus, on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Let's read it again. Verse 22, then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Say out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. I see men like trees walking. Verse 24. Looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. We're going to come back to that again in just a little while. Look at verse 25. Then he put his hands on his eyes again. Say again. Come on, say again. And he made him look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. It's the only story in the Bible where Jesus ever asked anybody had the miracle worked. It's also the only story in the Bible where Jesus ever touches anybody again. So we have to understand that, that there, is some, there are some nuances to this particular miracle narrative that are different than all of the other miracle narratives. There's some hidden things in here that I believe God specifically wanted to show us by letting us have, have a bird's eye view, as it were, into this particular encounter. First of all, the man is blind and he is brought to Jesus by his friends and his friends tell the man that he's going to touch you. That's the first thing that we learn about the story. The Bible says very clearly here in verse 22, they came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. They did the right thing by bringing the blind man. They did the wrong thing by telling him how to fix him. 
It was the right thing for them to bring the blind man. It was the wrong thing for them to try to dictate to him the method he was going to use to bring about the restoration of the man's vision. They wanted him to touch him because we always want God to do things that we're familiar with and comfortable with. And God is looking for an end result that brings him the greatest level of glory, even if it's a, even if it's a method that makes us uncomfortable in process. Think about this. He came to Bethsaida. Bethsaida is a city that would not repent. Let's go over together to Luke 10. Because I want to prove to you, I want to show you to the best of my ability why Jesus led the man out of the city. Go over, just, just, uh, just skip ahead to Luke 10. You can keep your ribbon there in your Bible. Keep your finger marker, offering envelope you didn't use, whatever. That was a joke. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. As lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, sandals, greet no one along the road, but whatever house you enter first say peace to this house and if a son of peace is there your peace will rest on it if not it will return to you remain in the house eating and drinking such things as they give for the laborer is worthy of his wages do not go from house to house whatever city you enter as they receive you eat such things as they set before you and heal the sick there and say to them the kingdom of God has come near to you I love that the kingdom of God has come near to you, verse 10. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. Isn't this good? Verse 12. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Here we go. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 14. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Bethsaida was a covenant land. Bethsaida was considered to be a region under the control of the continuing blessing of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. Tyre and Sidon represents a portion of the country that were not under the covenant, covenantial boundaries of which God established with Abraham. That's why uh, when Jesus goes to heal a woman's daughter or deliver a woman's daughter from Tyre and Sidon, that he has to explain to her that he's not sent but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He has to tell her, is it meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she says, truth, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And that's why Jesus says concerning her, I've not found this great of faith, no, not in all of Israel. Because Tyre and Sidon was not in Israel proper, Bethsaida was. was. Jesus said, you covenant people are rejecting something that would have gladly been accepted by people that were outside of the covenant. One of the difficult things to do is to get people who have something with God to embrace the next thing God is sending that doesn't look like anything like the something they already have. There is an arrogance, there is an entitlement, there is a conceit that came to the people of Israel because of what they had with Abraham. So when Jesus comes and tells them you need something more, they look at him and say, how could we need anything more? We have covenant with God through Abraham. And what they did not recognize was what they had was not essential enough or complete enough to bring them into the fullness of heaven's design. There's a theology that's roaming around the church right now that is a dual covenant theology that says the covenant that God made with Abraham can get the Jews into heaven. This is a fallacy. It's a heresy. It's absolutely incorrect. Jesus said, I am the way, 
the truth, the light, and no man comes to the Father unless he comes through me. God loves Jerusalem. God loves Israel. God loves the Jew. There is a special favor and blessing upon this particular group of people because of their heart toward the things of God. However, these people need Jesus just like a Muslim. These people need Jesus just like a Hindu. These people need Jesus just like a Buddhist. So Bethsaida had about it an arrogance that caused them to reject. Chorazin and Bethsaida are cities that rejected what the apostles were bringing to them, especially as it pertained to the supernatural. Especially as it pertained to the supernatural. Jesus had to teach them, uh, teach the apostles that the reject, that if, even if you didn't believe me for the words that I spoke, you should have believed me for the miracles that I'd done. And... We seem to be currently living in a culture where what we have with God is an endangered enough species that we will protect what we have in God and we are desperately afraid that God may be asking us to experience something new. That's why even when the apostolic anointing or the prophetic anointing comes into the room and begins to rattle the inside of you to try to get you to step it up. Something on the inside of you is resistant to that because you want to feel better about the fact that you are living in something you've been living in for years. <laughs> I, I don't want anybody to talk to me about what I've been doing. What I've been doing is fine. I don't lift my hands in church and I feel perfectly comfortable. There's nothing anywhere in the Bible that says you have to lift your hands in church. But why are you so adamant to fight that you don't? What is it on the inside of you that rejects change? What is it on the inside of you that puts your, 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 your boundaries and your borders and your I'm going to protect myself mentality? You put all of that up and you say, no, yeah, don't, don't touch it. No, don't touch it. Don't touch how I live my life. I know you can talk around preacher. This is what you, and this is what I walked into, frankly, when I took over oversight of the chapel. I took over a building full of men that thought if they didn't like what the pastor preached, they could email him and tell him that. This is an absolute abandonment of all biblical protocol. There has to be an honor and a respect. I mean men that would send blistering emails about what they didn't believe, about what the pastor said. Sometimes on Sundays they weren't even here. They just did it through hearsay. This is, this is, don't, don't you dare come in there and start. Don't you dare come in there and start. The man who wants to change is the man who never says, don't you dare come in here and deal with. You say, bring me something that will help me get to the next dimension. Bring me something that will help get me to the next level. Bring me something that will give me permission to change. And I believe you come to a church like this because you are tired of being patronized. Because you want more. Because there's a hunger on the inside of you to experience the next dimension. Somebody has got to show you what's anchoring you if they're ever going to give you permission to fly. And here comes Jesus into this city called Bethsaida that, that, that we learn is under a curse. The other things we learn through Luke 10 is that we learn we are forerunners. We learn that in verse 1 of chapter 10. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face. Into every city. There was a group of people that were forerunners. John the Baptist was called a forerunner. Dutch Sheets license plate on the front of his truck said, Goes ahead. One who blazes a trail, who, one who makes a path. The Bible said concerning John that he would be a voice crying in the wilderness that would prepare the way of the Lord, would make the crooked path straight, the high place low and the low place high. There's going to be an inconvenient, uncomfortable season of making a people ready for what God wants to do. And the arrogant conceit of our culture says, I'm already ready. If, we, if everybody who thinks they're ready is ready, then why haven't we seen it yet? Understand that God is not always sitting there on some sovereignty clock waiting on his perfect date to do something. In actuality, what God is doing is looking for a man who will stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And if he can find that man, he'll bring something into the land. And so when Jesus comes into Bethsaida or sends the disciples into Bethsaida, he sends them in as forerunners. That's the first thing we learn. The second thing that we learn is that we are laborers for harvest. We are laborers for harvest. Isn't that good news? Look at look at uh, look specifically at verse 
verse 2, verse 2. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. You'll never be satisfied until you get out of church membership and into the revelation that God sent you to labor for souls. That's really why we're coming together. That's really why I'm trying to challenge you to take your walk with God to a level it's never been to before. Because really what you need is not a safe place to come sit and soak. What you really need is to be equipped to be sent so that you go into the earth allowing people to experience a measure of the presence of God outside of this building that is every bit as powerful if not more so than what we experience in the building. Of all the miracles Jesus does, he only does two in the temple unless you consider the turning over of the money changers tables a miracle. And then he did three. Everything else he did, he did within the culture. Everything else he did, he did in the marketplace. He did sitting beside a well. He did in someone's home on a weekday. He was moving people out of a Sabbath revelation and into a sonship revelation. He was moving them out of ceremony and moving them into communion. We even turned around and made communion ceremony. I don't know how we've done this, but we've made everything ritualistic and ceremonial. And when God wants to move, we get up and we go to church on Sunday. And I'm telling you, you have an assignment where you spend six other days of your week around people that are needing for you to do more than have found a nice, good home church you can go to. First thing we learn, we're forerunners. Second thing we learn, we're laborers. Third thing we learn, we are lambs among wolves. We are lambs among wolves. Look at verse 3. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. That's exciting, huh? Thank you, Lord. I'm going to send you out, and this is the posture that I want you to have. I want you to be a lamb among a wolf. What I, want, I want there to be a distinguishing nature about you that makes you not violent and aggressive, but makes you meek and approachable. The only place that I'm confrontational with the gospel is in the church. I'll take it easy on everybody else. I expect sinners to act like sinners. I think if sinners are sinning, they're doing their job. I don't have a problem with people who aren't serving God being compromised. I think you should be compromised if you're not serving God. I don't have, it doesn't offend me when I go to a restaurant and somebody's smoking a cigarette by me. I'm, I'm, I know to mess with some of you sometimes, I might go sit in the bar area because if I'm going to fish, I'm going to go where there's fish. Oh, brother, I don't shut up. <laughs> uh, you hang out by the dessert table. That's just as much sin as the person hanging out in the smoking section. I got to move on. He said, I'm going to send you out as lambs among wolves. I'm going to make you distinguishable. You're not going to be just distinguishable because you're better. You're going to be distinguishable because there's going to be a humility and a posture about you that makes you attractive to people that would like to devour you, but they can't because the hand of God is on you. You're going to, you're going to stand out. People are going to look at you and say, what is it about you? I just want to hug you when I see you. I don't know what it is about you, but I just have to stop and talk to you. I don't understand it. We were eating dinner last night. Tammy was in here. She'd laugh when I says, we were eating dinner last night. And by the time this couple got done talking to us, I really felt like we should have asked them to pull up a chair. I've never met these people before in my life. It was 45 minutes into, I didn't even eat my supper because I couldn't put my food in my mouth. Cause I had to talk to these people that I don't know by the time the thing was over. And these people are lost as a goose in a snowstorm. They're not even pretending to halfway be saved. And by the time I get done talking to this guy, he's like, I just don't know. But some, for some reason, we were supposed to be here tonight. We don't ever come to this restaurant. And I said, well, it's the first time we've ever been here. Here's my phone number. Here's my home phone number. Here's my cell phone number. He doesn't know. He doesn't know anything about me. But I think God wants to make us remarkable. Not, not remarkable because we've excelled chasing material things and not remarkable because we stand out in how we look, or, but remarkable in that there is a lamb-like nature on the inside of us that reminds them of him. Why did, my God, why did he say, I'm going to send you out as lambs among wolves? Because he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world and he was going to put a savior nature on the inside of them that would rescue them out of his own meekness. I got to move on. That's not part of the sermon. Let me move on. 
Look at John 10, 37 and 38, and then we'll slip back to Mark 8 together, and I'll start wrapping this up. John 10. John 10, 37. I hear pages turning. John 10, 37. You there? If you ain't there by now, you're just going to have to fake it. John 10, 37. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Jesus is manifesting out of human flesh the greatest revelation of the kingdom of anybody who has or will ever live in history. He's not preaching out of the volumes of his imagination, but out of the significance of his experience. Imagine Jesus describing heaven. Imagine Jesus describing. He says on one occasion, I saw Satan or Lucifer fall like lightning. I remember when he was there. Imagine Jesus' description of cherubim and seraphim. The, the, the Bible teaches us that the books of the world could not contain if they tried to put all the things that Jesus did. Imagine all the things that he spoke. Imagine the truths. Imagine his description of cherubim and seraphim and six-winged creatures with eyes in front and behind. Come on. If John saw what he saw, imagine the revelation. That, that That's why people would follow him around without taking care for thought for bringing food for their kids and 5,000 men could not counting women and children to follow him into the desert and their kids don't have anything to eat until they have to take a little boy's lunch and break it up and divide it and multiply because they had to taste the honey that dripped forth from the lips of a man who was not teaching theories. He was manifesting experience. He was not preaching out of the volumes of his imagination, but out of the depths of his experience. He said, I do nothing that I hadn't seen the Father do. And he said, the things that I've been doing, what I have done is worth you believing in me, even if you don't like what I'm saying. So Bethsaida is under a curse because of their rejection of God's activity and the rejection of those that God ordains is the rejection of God. That's a deep thought and I don't have time to go there, but maybe on a Wednesday night we'll go into the idea that rejection of God's activity through those he ordains is rejection of God. To say you want to hear what God has to say, but you don't want to hear what men of God has to say, is to in essence say that you do not want to hear what God has to say. Ooh, that's difficult, huh? Rejection of God's activity through those he ordains is rejection of God. Bethsaida is a covenant land, and this is why Jesus says, Tyre and Sidon would have repented long ago. We talked a for a minute about the woman from Tyre and Sidon and him saying, I'm only sent unto the lost sheep of Israel. So they were living in a cursed land. And Jesus goes there anyway. The forerunners had been rejected. They had to shake the dust off their feet. And then Jesus goes back into the place of the curse. Because he is never intimidated by what's on the region. He understands that what he carries is far more powerful than what's on the region. And this seems to be somewhat of the mindset that I see that we wrestle with, especially in a religious culture. Well, people around here, you know, they just, they're just happy the way that they are. No, they're not. They just haven't seen enough difference in you to be able to see that there's anything different about you and them. They're not happy. In what, no, no. I sit and talk to them. People tell me things they don't tell other people. Same with you. People tell me things. So they're not, I'm not meeting the average person that goes to the typical traditional church where no spirit of God is moving and they sit down and tell me how happy they are. They're miserable. They just haven't seen enough distinction between their life and our life to want what we have instead of what they have. We look just like them, except we have tongues and raised hands and contemporary music. And I believe God's about to put some distinction on some people. I believe God is about to make a difference. Not, not because you have some hidden agenda of pride in you that makes you want to stand out, but because the lamb nature is so evident on the inside of you that when you get around the wolves, they say there's something different about him. There's something different about her. I can taste it. I can sense it. I can feel it. There's something about them. You can call it favor. You can call it the anointing. You can call it being carriers of the presence of God. That's probably all true. But it's evident that we don't blend in. I am tired of the religious culture telling me, don't stand out. Nobody in this Bible that ever did anything of any historic significance blended in. 
There's something in you that wants to be the real thing. I believe you come to a church like this because there's something in you that wants to have an experience and an encounter with God that lasts you beyond the altar. That can't just wait to get back so we can sing again. You can't wait to get to work so you can live your faith as lively in the workplace as you do in the altar. Come on, man. So think about this. Bethsaida is under the curse. Jesus goes into the teeth of the curse. We live in a curse culture, but Jesus goes to Bethsaida. He's not intimidated to step into the middle of the curse. This is not a moment to an embrace, embrace an escapism mentality. We must believe we are ordained as forerunners to blaze a trail for Jesus to invade the curse. This is not time to lock ourselves in our buildings and hold hands and pray the rapture happens quickly. That's not what I moved here for. I didn't, I didn't move here because I wanted to sit around and hear good music and listen to good sermons and feel better about the fact that we're not touching the world, man. I want to shake something in my day. I want to be a man with a thesis in my hand and a reformation in my heart. I want to be a man who carries a hammer and a nail and pounds something on the walls of the church that says you can have more with God than you've ever had before. I want to look into the eyes of men that are miserable going through the motions of dead American religion and tell them you could have a wildfire burning on the inside of you that would give you 10,000 times the fulfillment you've ever had enduring another dead church service. I believe there are people out there that are hungry. I believe there are people out there that are thirsty. I believe there are people out there that are asking questions. Is there not more? Is there not another level? Is there not another dimension? And God is going to give us a grace to display the lamb nature in the earth until they want not us, but the Jesus inside of us. Are you with me today? One type of behavior that I have found consistent in the lives of people who reject the activity of God is that they want everything on their terms. Think about this. In verse 22, they said, we got a blind man who needs to be healed. We believe that you have the power to heal him and we want you to touch him. We want you to touch him. I, I, I don't see anything wrong with their heart. I have a major problem with their preconceived idea. Their heart was they wanted to see the man who couldn't see be able to become the man who could see. The problem was they had a preconceived idea of the way Jesus should get that job done. We want you to touch him. Why? Because that's neat. In a minute, he spits on the dude. Come on, Jesus. Can you hear, can you see the religious thing rise up on the inside of people when he starts spitting on people? Say, well, show me that in the Bible. Now, we get that one a lot. Show me, if you're going to do that, show me that in the Bible. It's in that living epistle. You hadn't read that one yet. I ain't got time. I got to behave myself. Touch him. We brought him to you and we want you to touch him because we heard in the past when you healed other people, you touched them. So we want you to touch him. And the first thing that Jesus does, and I love this because it's just absolutely so like the nature of God. I love what he does next. Look at, look at, go, go back with me to Mark 8. Get back over there again as quick as you can. Mark chapter 8. They begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand, 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 I'm sorry, took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Why'd you lead him out of the town? Because I'm going to have to get you out of the curse if I'm going to ever get you into vision. So I can't, listen, I can't change your situation without changing your geography. The first thing he did is led the man out of the curse. I got to get you out of Bethsaida because this is a city that will not embrace what I've tried to bring into the past. They have rejected my voices, therefore they have rejected me. And the only reason I went into the curse is to try to rescue somebody that had a heart to get out of it. And he takes the blind man and he leads him out of Bethsaida. I think what Jesus should have done is healed the man before he led him because it would have been a lot easier for him to lead him had he first healed him. But he chose to lead a blind man to show the man, listen, that your dysfunction is a secondary consequence of your environment. And so if I'm going to fix your lack of vision, I've got to deal with the fact that you are living in a curse. So he leads the man out of the city. This is the mentality that says you can do what you need to do in my life as long as you do it on my terms. You can bring revival, but I'm not going to act like that. Or play that kind of music. 
or dance or speak in other tongues or fall out in the floor, I'm telling you, you don't want it bad enough. When you start saying, God, I want you to set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. He will literally set a fire down in your soul that you can't contain and can't control. And some of us are not dancing because we're extroverts. Some of us are dancing because he has done something on the inside of us that has moved us out of the comfort zone of our personality and our experience and our background. So he takes men that were politician, notable politician sons who were climbing the ladder and becoming a part of the upper echelon of the Baptist community. He sticks his spirit on the inside of them and transforms them to the place that they are made fun of by the people that they used to run with, but they would not trade where they are for where they were for all the gold in California. Set a fire down in my soul, but make sure I don't act like that. I don't want to be one of those. Sin revival got, but you know what? Now, now we don't want to be here all day. You see the mindset? God, I want you to change my life. Don't change it so much that I'm getting more interested in you than I am interested in my hobbies now. Come on now. Deer season's coming up. It's about to be time for college football. Uh -oh. Huh? Set a fire down in my soul. And really secretly on the inside of us, you know what we're really praying? Yeah, God, I want to be on fire for you, but I don't know about this not being in control thing. Because we live in a mirage that says if you're in control, you're safe. We live in the false idea that to be in control is liberty. Being in control is misery. This faith only works not when you visit his house. It only works when he owns you. It only works when he's as, at, as God at your house on Friday at night as he is at his house on Sunday morning. And if we had a handful of people living like that, we would shake this region. If we had a handful of people, the great Charles Finney who led the awakenings, who is, is said to have preached sermons until people would gather and, and, and his voice could be heard for four and five blocks with no PA system, with no microphone. He would come into a city. Charles Finney would come into a city and the whispers that Brother Finney was about to preach would come and people from hours away would hear that thing through the grapevine and they said men would leave their mules tied to their plows and run as fast as they could to hear him preach the gospel. Brother Finney got toward the end of his life and he was being interviewed by a newspaper in Connecticut and they said, Brother Finney, you've preached to hundreds of thousands of people in your life. What, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment in all of the hundreds of thousands of people that you've preached to, possibly millions of people around the country you've preached to? What is your greatest accomplishment? He said, in many areas, I feel as though I've failed. I said, what do you mean you feel as though you've failed? You've preached the gospel to hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of people in open air crusades all up and down the coast around this country. You believe you failed? He said, my whole life I looked for 10 men who hated nothing more than they hated sin and loved nothing more than they loved God. And if I would have found those 10 men, I would have changed the world. He said, I may have preached to hundreds of thousands. It's possible that I preached to millions, but I failed in trying to find 10 men. I'm telling you, there is enough potential in this room. This will be the smallest church I'll preach in all year. And I'm as excited about the potential in this little building as I am anywhere that I will go this year. I won't be more excited. I'm going to stand before 1,600 college students Tuesday and Wednesday and look in their eyes and know they're world changers. But I'm telling you, the potential of what God wants to do right here in this region is rattling down in my spirit right now. I feel the expectation that God wants to do something that's too big for one church and too big for one denomination and too big for one preacher. I feel the rumblings of something historic happening right here out of these woods. What if right here out of the sticks of Saluda, God began to manifest something that eye has not seen and ear has not heard. I don't, I don't mean this in arrogance. I don't believe I moved here for anything less. I didn't move here because I found a good kids for my good school for my kids to go to and a nice church we could go to on Sunday morning when I'm out of town. I could send my family to. I believe we're here for a revolution. I believe that God sent a group of people here that would believe him unashamedly and that we would see the fruit of his desire come to pass in this area. But I'm telling you, he's not going to touch us. And do it our way and leave us in our jacked up environment. He's going to take us out of the curse. 
He's going to start leading us out of the curse. He's going to quit babying your feelings. And he's going to start leading you out of the curse. He's going to say enough is enough. Quit crying about the past and let's move on. And let's begin to operate in the land of the blessing. Instead of, uh, instead of dis- explaining away our dysfunction because of the past. Get over it. Get up and let's move on. Everybody has hurt. Everybody has experienced pain. I was sitting with a gentleman. I preached at a church in Greenville. South Carolina, not this past Wednesday night, but the Wednesday night before. And I came home and I told my wife, she said, how did it go? I said, I repent for ever saying that my season was rough after I heard what this brother went through. You know, it's a guy who complains about and he has no shoes until he meets the man with no feet. You know, and so we think what we've been through and what we've been through and what I'm telling you, what you went through forged in you a desire to know the real God. And you have to get on the other side of it and almost in a sadistic way, say thank you. I never would have known about you what I know about you now. Thank you that you love me enough to save me for you. And let's move on. Let's march forward. I have a a feeling that this fall is going to be the most significant time in the history of the chapel. I sense prophetically that we are sitting on the precipice of God's heart and design for us. I believe September, October, and November will be the most significant months in the history of the life of this region. I believe God is going to begin to do things that are going to move over in to other ministries and other churches. I believe people are going to be able to come into this environment and taste something and take it back to another environment and see this thing begin to spread like wildfire. How's it going to happen? Is Damon going to come preach? Is, are we going to bring in a sp- Dutch sheets? Are we going to bring in a special musician? No. You're going to really start meaning what you've been singing and you're going to say, start a fire in me that I can't contain and that I can't control. You're the ones. You're the ones that work. You're the ones that work at the chicken plant, not me. Right? You're the ones that are planted in that school system. You're the ones that have the potential to rattle your environment. If you could say, God, I'm sick of being in the curse. And even if I can't see where we're going, lead me out of it. Could you imagine this man who can't see where he's going, being led to this man that he can't see when he gets there, being told when you get there, he's going to put his hands on you and you'll be able to see. And the first thing he does when he gets to Jesus is Jesus takes the man by the hand and, where, where, where are we? It's not for you to know. Just follow me. Just follow me. Because on the other side of this journey where you can't see the destination, you're going to have vision like you never imagined you would have vision. You're going to see things you never believed you would see. It's going to be more beautiful than you ever imagined it to be. Sure, you feel like you're blind right now and you're just having to follow him. But I'm telling you, every step you follow him is one step further away from the curse and one step closer to the promise. And all of a sudden, you're not interested in what you used to be interested in. You're not preserving your reputation anymore because that's the thinking of the curse. The thinking of the curse is I'm fine like I am. Leave me alone. And he's got something so much more fulfilling than the curse. He starts leading the man by the hand. He leads the man by the hand. The man can't see where he's going. God changes his environment before he changes his situation. Situation is often a byproduct of environment. If you're living in perversion, your marriage won't work until, first of all, he leads you out of the perversion. The problem with your perversion is not your wife. It's your perversion. And the first thing that has to happen is he has to lead you out of the curse. One of the reasons why your money doesn't work is because you deal with greed and you're a hoarder and you don't know how to give. And God will never bless your money until you get the greedy out of you. So God wants to change that environment and then he'll change your situation. Ooh, we're quiet. We get quiet anytime we talk about money in here. There's such a deep seated root of heresy in this church that the minister shouldn't talk to the people about money. It may take us years to get that junk off of you. I'll just be frank with you and tell you that the idea that men stood up here for years and didn't teach you about the tithe means they are thieves and robbers. It is the responsibility of the leader to identify the area in your life that's keeping you from the blessing. It's called leading you out of the curse. Poverty is the curse. Lack is the curse. Wealth with greed is a curse. And so God wants to lead you out of that curse so that you can be qualified to operate in his blessing. Amen. Somebody say amen. Even if it makes you mad, say amen. (laughs) <laughs> your money won't work if you're living in greed. Spiritual authority can't intervene if you're living in rebellion. So God brings us into a process where he changes an environment. And as he changes environment, he, changes, he then changes situation. But first he changes environment. You will never see right until you let him lead you out of the curse. He takes the dude who can't see, who's now in a town that he didn't know he was going to, leaving a town he was familiar with. And the first thing that he does is spit on the man. This is not at all what my friends told me was going to happen today when we left the house. 
how does that feel? Did he tell him it was coming? No, no, brace yourself, brother. I'm about to spit on you. He can't see. Come on, you can't just read through this and then, but he spit on him and Jesus is so holy that the Holy Spirit made him see. No, man, he's messing with the guy's thinking is what he's doing. Same way he messes with yours when he first said, raise your hands. And you went, oh my God, we never done that in my church. And your hand felt like it weighs a thousand pounds and you lifted it and realized you didn't get struck dead or become a member of a cult. Huh? And now you can't put them down. Now you just walk all the time. Just walk. La, 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 la. Yeah. He's messing with your thinking. He's messing with your thinking because you can't see you're in a curse. If you could see you're in a curse, you'd leave the curse. You're too blind to see where you are. So he leads you out of what you're in and then begins to do something that's incredibly uncomfortable for your flesh. But imagine what you're about to see. It's always on the other side of the most uncomfortable moments for our flesh that we inherit the thing that we have really always wanted to see. I came through the greatest season of the wilderness I could ever imagine. Came through the greatest season of the wilderness I could ever imagine. Finally started getting on the other side of it. We're in a meeting in Chattanooga. The room all of a sudden goes still. When the room goes still, a kid gets up out of a wheelchair and starts walking around in the altar area. When he gets up out of the wheelchair and starts walking around in the altar area, a girl who had bro her back broke in two places took her back brace off and started running around the room. Nathan, who felt he had a broken arm, got down and started doing push-ups in the middle of the platform. My mother, can I tell this story? Can I tell my mother had been dealing with a, a, a terrible situation concerning a lump in her breast. With, without faith, we were pretty sure she was going to get a bad report. The pain was so intense that at times it would bring her to her knees. She had gone for the mammogram. They showed the arrow revealing the spot on the mammogram scheduled for the next mammogram that should have been leading to a biopsy. That's what the next mammogram should have been done. She goes to the meeting there at the church that I'm preaching at in Greenville. All of a sudden, the pain is gone. There's no more pain. She feels like she's going to get a good report. No more lump in the breast. She goes in and gets the next mammogram that should be an all practicality leading to the biopsy. They go into that mammogram, and they can't find the spot that was on the other mammogram. Come on, man. I'm not talking about something that happened in Africa or in 1952. I'm talking about somebody that is sitting in this room. And I'm telling you, he led us out of the curse for a reason. He's about to do some supernatural things in us. Could not straighten your arm out. I was there. He couldn't bend. He couldn't fully flex his arm. It was swollen. There was a knot on the arm. We prayed. Nothing happened. We prayed. Nothing happened. We prayed. And about the fourth time we went back in and started praying, all of a sudden I saw his swelling start to go down. When it did, he said, I can stretch it out. I can stretch it out. Then he's able to get down and start doing push-ups. Only reason he wasn't in a cast that night is because he doesn't have insurance. Come on, man. Come on. God's not saying leave your religious traditional mindset because he wants you to experience something more freeing in worship. No, he's got something so much bigger than we ever imagined. And he's saying, come on, start a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Watch what happens in the story, and I'll get ready to let you go home. He spit on him. This is not going to happen on your terms. It never has happened on anybody's terms, and anybody that is real committed to their terms will miss his intervention. He's going to mess your world up. And when you get done protecting all of it and you let him mess it up, you'll get to the end of it and you'll start saying thank you that you messed it up. Nobody that has ever had God mess up their pretty little world has gotten to the other side of it and said, God, I wish you'd have left that alone. He's going to shake some things. He's going to rattle some things. And out of it, you're going to taste true life for the first time. He's calling us out of paradigms. He's calling us out of preconceived ideas. He's calling us out of religious mindsets. But what he's calling us out of does not compare to what he's calling us into. He's calling us into supernatural living. He's calling us into a realm of authority. He's calling us into a realm of, 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 of a fulfillment that we've never known before. He's going to allow us to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. He's going to see it, be, able, be able to place our hands on people and their desire for alcohol vanish out of the inside of them. He's going to allow us to be able to pray for people that are having perverse sexual desires and God rewire the inside of them until they begin to operate according to his pattern and his system. This is the assignment on a people that we won't have black churches and white churches in this area that you'll walk in and not be able to tell if it's black or white. You won't have traditional churches and contemporary churches 
You'll have hungry people in this region beginning to manifest forth the power and presence of God. It won't be a young church or an old church. It'll be a multi-generational synergy. A group of people that are coming together for one great cause. That is to see God glorified above all things in the earth. This is not what my companions told me he was going to do. He spits on him. I just absolutely love it. Verse 23. So he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands on him. Both eyes got spit on. That's in the Bible. Can't you see the Pharisees? I knew we knew his guy wasn't a real thing. In the way he got, there's no way the Son of God would be down here spitting on people. I knew he wasn't who he said he was. We've checked the prophecies, and Isaiah, Jeremiah, none of them said spitting. This is not in there. He cannot be the guy. Because they were all wrapped up in the method and they were missing the miracle. Spits on him, lays his hands on him, and says, do you see anything? This never happens anywhere else in the Bible. Do you see anything? He said, I see men like trees walking. This is what happens when your touch has not gone deeply enough. People remain inanimate objects. Men are not trees. Men are men. And if you claim to have been touched by God and are not interested in people, then you have not been touched deeply enough. He touched him. He, this man had had an incredible encounter. This man had had an off-the-charts incredible encounter with God. But God wasn't finished. He had to touch the men. He had to touch the man until he saw men as men. Bo is here. Bo and Russ are here. We're glad y'all are here today. But one of the, one of the most powerful moments I ever experienced in my life was tromping through debris after a tornado. Bo was right there by my side for that whole thing. And I may have been by her side more than she was by my side. She was leading the charge. But zipping people in body bags and zipping pieces of people in body bags. There was one particular man, Bo could tell the story better than I could. There was one particular man that couldn't find his wife. Been married for like 56 years. 62 years he'd been married to this woman. I can't find my wife. He's hysterical. We go into the makeshift morgue that we've set up. There's no air conditioning. There's no power. There's everything bodily fluids you can imagine is on the floor. Dead bodies, pieces of dead bodies. And we go in and we look for this woman and he gives her a description and we think she's not in there. He starts telling the story. They've been married 62 years, but well, how many, how many, the last few he had got, she had led him to the Lord. And he had talked about how the last few years of my life were the greatest years of my life because my wife had led me into a relationship with Jesus. And you've got to find her. You've got to find her. I don't know how many hours we screamed that woman's name walking through. I'm talking about debris is not the word. There were houses that most of the homes were ready to build on immediately. The slab was so clean. We screamed that woman's name. We yelled that woman's name. We kicked over boards. We waded down in nasty water that had filled storm tunnels. And, you know, I can remember the men getting us together and saying, this is gone from a rescue to a recovery. And now we're just looking for a body. And we looked and we looked and we looked and we looked. And I can remember when, when us going back to him again. Said, Give us the description again. Maybe she's in one of these body bags. Give us the description again. He gives the description again. and Finally, Bo goes back in there and she finds a body with a ring on it. Was able to pull the ring off that dead woman's finger and ask that man, is this her? And then he knew that was her. It was in that body bag. And I watched people that danced all over the church that while we were looking for bodies, they were hiding in air conditioning hotels waiting for their power to come back on. I tasted the reality of what the real gospel was that day. That, that, that all of our experiences in God and all of the depths of our speaking in tongues and our dancing is of no value if we don't have interest in seeing men like men instead of men like trees. I'm telling you, God is going to burn in us an understanding that he's not bringing us together because he needs a people to have a feeling or a people to have an experience. He needs a lamb who can show among the wolves. He's looking for a people who can stand out. Jesus put his hand on the man and he said, do you see anything? The man said, I see men like 
trees walking. What is the lesson here? You can be following Jesus, have had an over the top encounter like being spit on, be touched and still not see people right. I see men as trees. You've got to get touched so deeply that people are no longer inan inanimate objects. Men are not trees. People are not numbers to be counted and checks to be cashed. He made the man look up. When he touched him the second time, he elevated his vision. And when the man elevated his vision, he was then able to see properly. That's why Jesus said to the disciples, Say ye not four more months, and then cometh harvest. For I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are already wipe, ripe unto harvest. You can't see people right until you look up. God's looking for a people that have a burning that makes them see people right. That makes them see the people they work with, the people they go to school with. To see them the way that God sees them. When you lift your vision into the realm of eternity, it is there that we see people right. If you feel in this room today that you're called into the ministry, forget about pulpits and microphones and being a star and start helping somebody. I refuse to have a bunch of wannabe rock stars waiting for somebody to give them a mantle. I want people that burn for people. I want people that burn for people. I believe that we are moving into the greatest fall in the history of this ministry. I believe God's going to do more in September, October, and November, specifically those three months this year than all the other years combined. And prophetic voices agree that this is one of the things God's saying, that as we move into the beginning of September, we are stepping into a Hebraic new year. We talked about this a little bit, uh, Brother Gibson and I. We are stepping into a new beginning. We are stepping into a new season. We are beginning to step into a new dispensation of what God wants to do in the earth. And God's going to take everything we thought was great church and he's going to shake it up and he's going to give us something that we have not even known how to ask for. He's going to give us souls. He's going to give us people being saved. He's going to give us supernatural healings in people's body. I believe God is going to use the miracle in some of your desperate situations to be a sign and a wonder to this community that our God is real and our God is alive I'm telling you I'm telling you today ask him one more time come on Matt set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain that I can't control don't waste your vapor If life is but a vapor, don't waste your vapor. Don't waste your vapor. Be a lamb among wolves. Be Jesus with skin on. Walk the streets until when they see you, they can't help but think about him. I want to hug people, and when I hug them, I want them to feel him. I want to stick a wad of money in their hand, and when that wad of money hits their hand, they don't want to know anything about me. They want to know him. Vess and I were coming home from Greenville the other night. We wanted to get something to eat. We found this little Mexican restaurant, and I, and I did what I hate for other people to do. I walked into the restaurant seven minutes before it closes. We walked in that restaurant seven minutes before it closed, and those people waited on us like we were kings. They laughed. They celebrated. They, they were singing. They were doing their thing, and they were making sure we had everything we needed. And I took all the money that I had in my pocket. I said, how many people are working in here? I asked the lady. I don't mean this braggingly. I just want to show you a principle. How many people are working in here? She comes back. She gives me the number of people. So we give a, a significant bill to every one of those people that are working in that restaurant. And I gave it to this one man. And he looked at me and he said, who are you? He said again, who are you? I said, man, I just preach for Jesus. I'm just a preacher. Jesus. And he said, I have to talk to you. Didn't he? I have to talk to you. I have to talk to you. I take the check where they write the bill out, write my phone number on the back of the check and give to the man because he's just looking for somebody. 
who can see people right. They're walking our streets, man. Why do you think we live here? Why do you think we live here unless there are desperate hurting people that need somebody to say, I know what you're looking for. I want to light that fire on the inside of you today that you can't contain and that you can't control. I'm praying for the grace of God right now because yesterday at Huddle House, I felt like the Lord told me to share the gospel with a man and I didn't do it and I'm looking for his truck. I'm believing God's going to give me another encounter. I carried that thing around, not with condemnation, but with a lesson learned. God, let I paid real good attention to his truck. I can describe the rims. I know four of the digits on his license plate because I know what it felt like for him to pull out and me not to have shared the gospel with him. I'll find him again. I'll find him again. Jesus, mighty God. What's about to happen here? And I don't want you to miss it because you wanted to maintain your manageable flame. I want a wind to blow. I want a wind to hit this thing. And I want it to start consuming families. I want the fire of God to start consuming teachers and schools and nurses and hospitals and preachers and pulpits. I want the fire of God to begin to burn, man. I want the raging flames of God to be seen in this area. I want an awakening of historic proportion. I want to see people getting saved in this city until the government has to come and say, how can we help? Oh, my God. I want to see buses pull up in the roughest parts of our neighborhoods and drive people into the churches and start dropping them off all over town. And there'll be meals. Come on, dream with me. There'll be meals prepared for those people when they get out of church. There'll be tennis shoes and backpacks waiting on children that are going to school in hand-me-downs. I want to see a true revolution come that the lambs start to stand out among the wolves. I'm tired of the church looking just like wolves. I'm tired of us taking people, using them, and throwing them away. I want us to understand for what great cause he brought this company together. For what great cause did God bring this company together? Lambs among wolves. I'm going to ask Matt to sing it again. And I want you to hear it in light of this revelation. God's going to spit on some people in the days to come. God's going to cause some of you to get to the point you can't just worship sitting between those chairs and you're going to have to get out and you're going to have to step up and you're going to have to let what's on the inside of you come out. You have to start worshiping at church like you would never have worshiped in public before the wind started to blow. I happen to believe this group of people is called for something so much more significant than to be members of a good church. If that's what you want, you really have the wrong leadership across the board because you got a group of men leading you that have been touched deeply enough that they want something more than some religious calisthenics on Sunday morning to make them feel better about the rest of their week I want to see people touched I want to see people touched man. I want to see people healed I want to find every broken marriage that we can get our hands on that's represented in this community. And I want to see husbands and wives with hands joined together, lifted in the presence of God, saying, He has made us new. There's no good stopping point. We just go until His kingdom covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. His glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and His Christ. We're going, man. We're embarking. I feel like we're, I feel like we're getting in that riverbank. I feel like the past is finally behind us. I feel like old things have passed away. All things have become new. And I feel this immersion coming into this new dimension. It started in the baptismal service, to be frank with you. Some things just changed that day. They shifted that day. And God continues to add. It, it happened. It started happening when Pastor Johnson did this series on the prodigal son. Things started shifting and changing at that point. And people started getting, getting a real revelation of how the Father felt about them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Matt to sing it again. But this time when he sings it, I'm going to invite you to come forward. If you're really ready to make that commitment and make that statement in your heart that you want God to set a fire down in your soul that you can't contain and that you can't control. He's going to start singing that. And if you seriously want God to do that in your heart, then I want to open this altar up to you. Some of our leaders will be here to pray for you and lay hands on you and come into agreement that you're going to get, get rid of this compartmentalized hypocrisy and you're going to begin to move into a real burning flame.
God, we want to burn for you. We don't want to play games. We don't want to go through the motions. We're not asking you for normal religion. We're asking for a burning, flaming encounter with you, Jesus. I'm asking for you to stoke fires in here tonight. God, I'm asking for the wind to come blow on coals. I'm asking for you to give combustion where there are inactive ingredients. God, I'm asking for the flame to burn. I'm asking for the glory to come. I'm asking for the power of God to begin to be seen in Jesus' name. I want more of you, God. Shut a fire down in my soul. I can't contain. I can't control. I want to burn, God. Oh, uh, yeah. I want to burn, God. I want to do it your way, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain. I want to burn for you, Jesus. I give you permission to take this flame out of its boundaries and out of its box. I give you permission, God, to take my fire to let your wind blow, Jesus. I can't contain. Can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Shed a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more. I want to see people right, Jesus. I want to see people right. More of you, God. Shed a fire down. Break us for what breaks you, God. We want to be moved by what moves you, God. God, we are being set up for the greatest fall of our lives. This is going to be the fall. The fall of our dreams. The fall of 2013, God. We're going to fall into intimacy like we've never known. We're going to fall into grace like we've never known before. We want more of you, Lord. So set up. That I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Shed a fire in my soul. I can't contain. I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. I want more. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. He's leading you out of that curse right now. Come on, take him by the hand. Even if you can't see where you're going, take him by the hand. Trust him that you're leaving the curse. You're coming out of the bondage. Come on, stuff you've dealt with for years, stuff you've carried around for years. The baggage of that bondage. Come on, you're stepping out of that. Even if you can't see where you're going, you got a really good leader. Come on, he's taking you by the hand. He's taking you by the hand. Let him lead you out right now. Let him lead you out of addiction right now. Let him lead you out of bondage right now. Come on, take him by the hand. the Lord saying there are many of you you've you've had an encounter God wants to do something deeper today you've tasted part but God wants to finish there's an old song that they used to sing years ago that says when you fell did you fall far enough when you fell for him did you fall far enough I say over you today that there's a finishing work coming God's touched you, but things have been blurry. God has touched you, but things have been unclear. God has touched you, but you've still felt like you're lost in the fog. And I say things are becoming clear today. I declare concerning you that you have eyes to see and ears to hear. That the dimension that you were designed for is becoming very, very clear to you. The assignment God has for your life is becoming very, very clear to you. I invite you out of the haze. I invite you out of the haze right now. Here's what I see the Lord saying. Some of you have had an encounter and you've had a touch, but you have felt things trickling back toward normal. Oh, Jesus. You felt things starting to migrate back toward ordinary. 
Woo, and I break that today in Jesus' name. And I declare that he who has begun a good work in you, he is faithful and just to complete it. Hallelujah. I declare that God is able to keep that that has been committed unto him. And not one of the words that you spoke have fallen to the ground, but God is upholding those words by the strength of his own name. And right now, in Jesus' name, I declare there's a... Whoa, hallelujah. There's a fresh initiating of that journey, that pursuit that is in you, that desire that was in you, that, that, that used to get you up early in the morning is being returned to you in Jesus' name. The voice is becoming clear again. There's been a mute button. The mute button has been hit, but God said even today, I'm taking that mute button off and I'm giving a recircumcision of the ear and I am cutting away the flesh that's preventing you from hearing and you're going to hear again in Jesus' name. I declare concerning you that you are going to hear again in Jesus' name. Matt's going to sing. Sing that softly, Matt. I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes because I just feel like there's somebody in here today that's not walking with God. Man. feel like there's somebody in here today and you have allowed sin to come in your life and separate you from God and you don't want to leave here in that condition today. You want to leave here changed. You are priority number one for Almighty God today. His love is in this room asking you to step into a life of real fulfillment. If you're in this building this morning and you're not serving God, there's sin in your life keeping you from serving God. Maybe there was a time in your life you served God, but you're not serving God now the way you once did, and you want that to change today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, God dealing with the hearts of men and women. If you're here today, and there's sin in your life separating you from God, and you don't want to leave here in that condition. You don't want to leave here in that condition. God will change it today. And you'll leave here with what the Bible calls peace that surpasses all understanding. If you don't know the Lord, you've allowed sin to come in your life. Maybe there was a time you used to serve God and you've turned from serving Him. And you don't want to leave here like that today. Then on the count of three, with nobody looking around between you and God, on the count of three, I want you to put your hand in the air. We're going to pray for you. One, two, three. Now, slip your hand up quickly. Hands up all over the room. All over the room. One, two, three, four. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve hands in the room. You, you can put your hand down. Is there anybody else that didn't raise your hand but you needed to? Come on, slip it up quickly. There's another one. There's 13. Anybody else? Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't leave here like that today. Anybody else? You've let sin separate you from God and you want it to change today. Come on, quickly. If God is pulling on your heart, I'm telling you, that's God. I see your hand, man. I see your hand. Two more hands. Come on. Come on. Anybody else? Come on. Don't leave here like you are. God will touch you and change you today. Oh, he's doing it already. Come on, let's lift our hands to him. Sing it with some force, Matt. Sing it with force. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain. I can't control. Come on, give it to him. Hallelujah. Come on, just lift your hands to him and sing it. Set a fire down in my soul. That I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more we want you, Jesus. You, Every piece I of me cries out for you, you Lord. God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain. Father, we thank you for what you've done today. I thank you that you got me out of the curse. Even when I didn't know what you were doing, you were faithful to get me out of the curse. Some of the things that I thought were the blessing that really were the curse, and you got me out of that curse too. You've been faithful, and you're true. Hallelujah. I want us to do this. I never do what I'm about to do right now, but I feel like doing it this morning. I want us 14 people, 14 people raise their hands this morning in our 
little gathering here in the woods that they wanted to get right with Jesus. That really is why I got on a, a bus, a train, a plane, a broke down car and started traveling to preach the gospel many, many years ago. So I want to see people get saved. Man. I, you, you getting entertained for another Sunday morning has very little interest in any of us. Amen. God's done enough in us. We ought to be able to turn that loose on somebody else by now. Amen. So especially those 14 people, but we believe in the power of the prayer of agreement and every person in this room, we're going to pray this together this morning. Everybody together say this. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. I believe today in Saluda, Jesus is not dead. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. And because Jesus is alive, I can live. I receive the life that you paid for as a free gift by faith through grace. And I believe today I will never, never, never be the same again in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody celebrate the decisions just made for the Lord. And I'll say this, not I don't know everybody in this room as well as I would like to know everybody in this room, but I'm going to tell you half of the people that raise their hands, I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen them before. That means for those of us that, that call this place home, I want you to assume that every other person in this building just made a decision for Jesus. And I want you to love on people that have been looking for family, that have been looking for hope, that have been looking for a reason to live. I want, before they get to their car, I want them to have hugs, high fives, invitations to lunch, give them your car, whatever God tells you to do. Amen. I want to challenge you in closing today. Pray for me, first of all, that my wife doesn't kill me that church lasted this long while she is in the back with your kids. And if your kids have marks on them, she just probably had enough. If you'll whip them at home, we won't have to whip them here, praise God. But I want to say this. I want to say that we're being positioned for the greatest fall of our lives. Fall of 2013 is historic in the eyes of God. And, it's, and specifically for this area right here, it's very, very important. I want you to take your compartmentalized flame and believe that the wind blew on it today and it's out of control let that flame burn tell people I tell you I think there's a I think this that the uh the event on the 4th of September is it the 4th is that correct it's going to be at Saluda High School that's an incredible opportunity to invite people to come be a part of something that's not a church but could really have an impact on a lot of people invite people to come here Dutch Sheets if they've never heard him before if, if I'm a father to you, this is grandpa because he's a father to me and he'll be coming in this place. He loves this house. He loves what God's doing here. And he's he has been as pivotal as anybody alive in mine and Tammy's life in getting us to where we are at this point. So please invite people out to that. Become ready to receive and expect. I had something unusual happen to me yesterday and I'll close with this. Is I had had a conversation with David uh, about where Daryl Bazard lived. Remember that? We were talking about cows. And Lyndon was there too. And they described to me where Daryl Bazard lived. And I drove by Daryl and Pamela's house last night twice. And were talking about Daryl and Pamela. And then came in and found out he'd had an injury and his leg hurt. His leg had to have some surgery. He's doing good. But let's pray for him right now. Father, we, we love Daryl and Pamela and are thankful that their kids are here today. We just celebrate them, Lord. We're thankful for this family, thankful for what they mean to this community. And, Father, I pray that there would be a speedy recovery for Daryl in Jesus' name. I pray that there would be no long-term complications in his leg. I pray very quickly, God, that you get him up out of that bed and allow him to go back and do the things he loves to do, Lord. Thank you that he'll be chasing cows and cutting trees and going to ball games very, very quickly, Lord. We bless him. I bless you for preserving his life in the past and for what you're going to do in his life in the future. We bless the Bazaars today, their, the Bazaars, their family, their children, all of them today. We just declare everything they set their hand to prospers. The love of God fills their home today. 
in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for healing my mother. I thank you, Lord, that there is no lump, that there is no tumor, that there is no bad diagnosis. Lord, I thank you that you're healing Bill Amick in Jesus' name. I just declare that we are in faith and standing, that wholeness is coming, and there's a bright future. If he can do it for one, he can do it for all. Amen. We celebrate you today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be dismissed. T3 Tuesday night, church again Wednesday night.